we have run uh, this format Q&A for a number of years now on different topics, um, and we try to make them topics that are of relevance to the community, that are topical, as it were. We, we've run a session on Murray-Darling Basin, for example. I think we called it Food or Frogs. Uh, and we've run a session about drugs in sport last year and other things like that that were topical at the time. At the moment, um, science and maths education is topical, very topical. Um, and uh, there's a lot of discussion uh, in the community, a lot of discussion in government, I'm sure a lot of discussion in education circles about how we, we improve and how we ensure that our science and maths education is engaging for the next generation of students coming through the education system. And we have a panel here tonight of experts, especially in mathematics education. And um, we're going to run this Q&A session. And Philip Clark from the ABC is our um, compere. And uh, I'll hand straight over to Philip to get the ball rolling and introduce the panel. Thank you, Philip. Thanks, uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor. Uh, OK, well, the, the format will simply be uh, welcome, everybody. It's good to see you all here. I'll, I'll, I'll fix this mic here, I think. Our panel will have, uh, will have some mics there that they can pick up and use. I'd love this to be interactive, though. It's a discussion. It's not a, it's not a lecture or a dissertation. So please, uh, the, everybody in the room has got views on these matters. and. Uh, uh, don't assume for one second that your views are, are uninformed. So please join the. I mean, this is a discussion. So please join the discussion. It's an important topic. So uh, we'd uh, we'd love you to be to be part of it. Just raise your hand. I'll keep an eye out, and we've, uh, we can pass the mic uh, to you to to make sure you're part of the discussion. So um, welcome this afternoon. Our panel uh, we've assembled uh, is uh, well a range of people with a range of views about matters. So just starting over here to my uh, to my right, Mike Clapper is the Executive Director of the Australian Mathematics Trust. Mike, uh, welcome. Mike has had long experience in mathematics education and I'm very keen to ask him questions about whether he thinks things have got worse over the years. It's uh, maybe a function of old age that we have this sort of pessimism, but, uh, but I wonder in an empirical sense whether that is the case. Uh, Mike's worked in schools uh, both here in the UK, Victoria and New South Wales for, uh, for over 40 years in, in mathematics and uh, also works on the Australian Mathematics Competition, and we were just chatting earlier about his experience too with the International Maths Olympiad, which is uh, uh, an area where Australia has done, and this doesn't get reported enough, often surprisingly well. Uh, uh, moving uh, further over, uh, Tom Lowry, who I spoke to earlier this morning on uh, my program on Triple Six ABC Canberra. Uh, Professor Lowry is uh, an internationally known maths education researcher here at the University of Canberra and has had a long career in mathematics education. And uh, he, in particular, will bring expertise to bear on the international uh, scope and, uh, and dimensions of, of, the, of the issue. I don't want to use the word problem because I, I'm not sure yet whether there is one. Uh, I'm hoping that our panel will be able to elucidate that. Uh, Doctor, uh, oh, sorry, in the middle here we have Professor Robin Jorgensen. Uh, professor, welcome. Professor of Education equity and pedagogy at the University of Canberra. And in particular, uh, her research interests have centred a lot on, uh, on uh, issues to do with ethnic and remote communities in Australia and the educational opportunities that are available to them. So uh, I'm particularly keen to address issues here in relation to whether or not the opportunities that are available in the cities and the big universities such as UC here or ANU in Canberra in particular, uh, are those opportunities uh, centred? Do we? Is, what, what is the equity and participation like for students outside those uh, those centres? And uh, Dr. Stuart Colhagen is, uh, joins us as well, well-known science and maths educator um, from uh, the Questacon. I think you've been there for more than 30 years, haven't you, uh, Stuart? Uh, 30, 36. 36 years, uh, all up. Questacon, as we know, is uh, uh, an uh, uh, internationally renowned centre of excellence in, in science education. So uh, there are perspectives there in how we uh, bring uh, knowledge of science, its importance, mathematics of course included, to, uh, to the community and engage with the community more generally about it. So uh, well, that's our panel. Uh, there's you as well, so you're part of it. So make sure you put up your hand and um, if you don't like what's being said, get stuck into them. Uh, if you think that something's being said which is wrong, get stuck into them. Or if you actually have a perspective which you don't think is being brought out, or a question to ask. Uh, I've got lots of questions, but I'm sure uh, you'll have more. So, Tom, could we start with, with you? And uh, when I was uh, told that uh, uh, the, the topic would be teachers 
uh, and student or teachers plus students, why isn't the, the equation adding up? I thought, well, that's describing a problem. Is there a problem in maths education? One of the things we often hear is that we are falling behind in the race um, with, uh, with emerging economies and uh, systems like China and India where engineering, maths and science is, uh, is much more valued, taught uh, better and frankly is churning out graduates at a faster rate with better qualifications than we are managing. Is there a problem in maths participation and education in Australia? And more importantly, and more specifically, how do we, uh, how do we rank with the countries that I've mentioned? Okay, thank you, Phil. Um, when Phil asked me this question this morning on air, I said there was no problem. And um, I've changed my mind since then because <laughs> I was watching a, um, like the, the Today Show or something like that this morning and um, there was a, uh, a young person on there, about 30, and um, she was, and there was this view that um, school principals need to now um, take one year off to study um, how to allow their children to be better at nap plan results in mathematics and, and um, literacy. And it was going to cost the Australian millions and millions of dollars to do this. And, and the principals were saying this wasn't very good. And this young, per um, this young lady was on there and she said um, with, with, with great confidence um, that half of the children in Australia failed the nap plan this year. You would like that. And... and as I've sort of, I've got a sore knee, as I started to fall off my chair, she said, which means that they don't even know their tables. So, so the answer to your question is, is there a problem? Yes, there is a problem. Because straight away there's a perception problem in Australia, at least, where there's this strong view that um, we're in trouble with mathematics. And statements like that um, resonate with a lot of people. And I'm sure a lot of people are listening to that today and actually believe what she said. But, I mean, statistically, it's amazing, that statement alone, let alone, let alone conceptually and, and let alone um, with the intent to what the NAP plan actually does, to say that half the children this year failed. And she said this year, which means, by implication, that half the children didn't fail last year. So, so yes, there is a problem. Um, there's a, there's a uh, dramatic perception problem. And, and, and some of this is, has, has um, I think... Um, come from our competitive nature, Phil. Whenever Australia sees a table, they want to be at the best of the world at it. Mm. And, and in the last 15 years, we've slid down um, on some of the international um, results, both in Tim's and Pisa, uh, and we were initially quite high and are dropping all the time. And um, as I said this morning, my view at why we're dropping is because these tests... Um, are particularly um, done well by countries that have very traditional curricula, uh, very traditional cultures, and a sense of having to practice, 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 and the more you practice, the better you get at producing results. Now, our society is quite different than that, and um, we, we encourage much more open-ended investigations, open-ended problem solving, the capacity to really um, make sense of deep problems, as Mike will talk about later with the Mathemat Olympia and so on. and but um, we, if, if we're continually being pushed as educators to actually fall back to worrying about getting these things right, there, there has to be um, this, this conflict in between. And so um, some, some of the um, people in the US often say we'd far prefer to be last in something like TIMS or PISA, which are these international tests, and get a lot of people winning Nobel laureates, or in the mathematics sense, Fields medals, right? That, I mean, that's the ultimate, okay? They'd prefer that, but, um, and of course, you can't get those sorts of awards unless you're highly creative um, and, and can problem solve really well. So we, we've got this really um, strong challenge in Australia, and I think it's increasing in intensity, uh, where we have to really start to have different conversations, because for, for comments like that this morning, um, they, they really take hold and they're hard to disrupt. Mm. Okay, Mike, what's your, ex your experience? I mean, you've, you've been actually dealing with things at the coalfaces, we're dealing with students for 40 years. Is it, I mean, are we less competent? Are, 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 are kids doing worse? Well, it's a delight to know that half the students are below average, because I suspect what that um, uh, person was saying this morning, it's always good to be uh, affirmed in, in, in what an average is. Um, look, uh, I, th I think Tom's right. At, at the top level, we still do very well, and... and for the benefit of the audience, I'll repeat what I said earlier, that we, Australia had the top student in the world in the International Maths Olympiad uh, last year. So we can compete at the very highest level. However, clearly, 
uh, we have an issue with the number of students deciding not to take uh, the higher level math subjects uh, in senior high school or on into universities. Can, can I just pick up on that point before you go on? Is that an actual fact? Because we hear this uh, anecdotally, but is it, is it a fact that, that's, that there are fewer students per capita uh, taking up advanced, you know, the, 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 the most there, advanced there is mathematics a decline in, in, in the, the HSC? Rates, there certainly is a decline in the rates of students doing the higher level subjects, and in particular, a decline in the number of girls, less so in the ACT than in some other states. So that is an issue. Uh, the question of, of, of whether performance is actually worse. It's not easy to ascertain that from the, the statistics for the Australian Maths competition because the cohort taking that competition has changed over time, largely as a result of the introduction of the NAP plan, so that schools, rather than enter their whole cohort, tend to enter only a smaller number for the maths competition, so the cohort is changing. So statistically, we have a little bit of a, uh, a, a caveat to put around anything we might say. Nevertheless, I would say that I see no particular decline, this is a bit, therefore a bit of a generalization, in, in students' logical capacity. Uh, when we ask a question that requires them to sort of nut it out logically, uh, use their intuition, they do just as well as they've ever done. We do, however, see uh, students maybe struggling a little more with questions that require technical skills. So manipulating percentages or, or decimals or using indices or some algebraic manipulation and in particular, there seems to be a kind of disjunction between uh, the technical skills that they may have and actually solving a problem. So it's as if uh, they don't ally their intuition with their technical proficiency, and I think that's a significant issue. And if, if I could just put um, a, a teacher perspective and a student perspective around this, I think the key issue that we have is, for students is, is one of engagement actually thinking that mathematics is relevant, powerful, and purposeful. And if they don't think that, why would they bother to do it? And the other side of that coin, and but intimately connected with it, is the fact that we are struggling to get enough qualified teachers teaching mathematics and probably the other sciences as well. I know, for instance, that there is one relatively new senior high school uh, in the ACT that does not have a single qualified math teacher, somebody who's done a maths major. Now, there may be more than one, and I'm certainly not going to name the school, uh, but it's a problem not only here, but you go into Western Sydney, you'll find lots of schools that do not have a single qualified math teacher. So it is not entirely surprising that the students are not being engaged when we're unable to attract people into the profession mm -hmm. who can uh, really understand the mathematics that they're teaching. Mm. Why would that be the case? It's not as though maths has declined in importance. As we're constantly reminded, Google, uh, which has changed the culture of the world, is just mathematics, it's nothing else, uh, when its relevance is perhaps more than it's ever been. Wh why do we have this problem? Are you still with me? Yeah, I think there are more opportunities. Yeah. I think there are more opportunities in mathematics than there have ever been. I think increasingly, mathematicians can put their skills into other disciplines uh, where the kind of mathematical modeling is really relevant. So you can get uh, people going into biology or ecology or any of the other sciences or into finance or into, uh, well, all of the, uh, the team that run the Simpsons show uh, mm. are all math math mathematical yes. nerds because uh, they can do animation. So mathematics is a very uh, transferable skill. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not able to convince students of that. Hmm. All right, um, Robin, to you. I mean, I made the point that you've done a lot of research in, into whether or not um, excellence in teaching trans translates equitably across the population. Is it is it a problem? Is this decline a problem everywhere, and particularly in regional ethnic communities and uh, indigenous communities? Yep, grab your microphone. Sorry, yeah. I think it's bigger than. Does that work? Yeah. yeah. I think it's bigger than that. Um, we have issues in um, the urban settings. It's not just um, a geographical location, it's all about, also about socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, so when you're starting to look at kids from different backgrounds, what they're bringing into the maths classroom, um, what maths is actually acknowledging, what maths is actually supporting. A lot of the work I'm doing out in remote indigenous contexts, for example, um, if you had, how do you actually teach a child who speaks Pitanjara as their first language? In their home language, they'll only have one, two, three, many. So how do you teach number? place value and all of those other concepts. So what we're looking for are teachers who 
have a good understanding of mathematics, but also know how to make bridges between the cultures of the students. So whether they're students from a low SES background, mm -hmm. um, whether they're a student from a, um, a refugee background, whether they're a student from another background that just um, may not speak English as their first language, or whether we're talking about remote Indigenous contexts, the culture of mathematics is very different from the culture that a lot of kids bring to the school. So good teachers are able to bridge that that uh, cultural difference and the language of mathematics as well. So what we see in a lot of classrooms are teachers who may not understand the culture and nuances, it means equals, and understanding the notion of equivalence across those two. So teachers, the good teachers we see in the... What happens in... Um, and following on from what Tom was saying, Australia is doing well. Um, but we're doing well only in some areas. Our tail, those students from disadvantaged backgrounds, is one of the biggest in the world. We are doing really, really poorly in that tail end. We've got to do a lot much... Uh, 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 much oh, now I've forgotten it. We've got to, we've got to do much better in that yeah. area. Um, and if we can do that, that's where we're going to make the difference. We've got to, make, we've got to start hitting our equity target groups and understanding how to bring those, those students forward. And then we'll see the big difference. Our kids who are doing well are doing really, really well. But our kids who aren't doing well aren't doing very well at all. So mm. having um, a range of different strategies in those contexts is really important. Mm. Having good teachers... Um, and we hear the Noel Pearsons talking about it's important to send our best teachers into those contexts rather than a lot of our fresh graduates who are fresh to teaching, fresh to education, always live in the cities and they don't understand those contexts. They're often from middle class backgrounds and we're throwing them into some of the um, poorest areas. I'm from Queensland, so I don't know the geography here, so I can't um, make equivalents of schools. Um, but having the, the, the right teacher qualities in those areas is important. But it's not just teachers. Um, there's a whole lot of other resources that go with that, including the families, um, including the actual physical resources in the classrooms, how you use those physical resources. Um, there's a whole lot of other issues about how we bring those students forward. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a plea for better teaching, and, and, and I'd like to, to flesh out and discuss that a bit more. Stuart, to you, um, uh, I mean, you've been involved in the, the, the I suppose, the, the business of engaging the community and, uh, and, and, and younger people in particular. Just off the back of Mike and Tom's point, you know, why is it in an era where mathematics seems to be more relevant than ever, from animation to the making of computer games to to computer programming, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Mathematics never has seen more relevant, nor more job-friendly, in a sense, too. W w why is it, or is it in your experience, that, that people are less engaged with it? Um, well, look, thanks for, thanks for such a simple question um, <laughs> early on. Um, I'd just like to just correct just one, one thing before I sort of you know, bury myself in that, in that, mm. in that question. Uh, when you sort of said there were four experts uh, up, up here on education. Well, there are three experts in education, uh, and someone that's a recovering dyslexic that spent quite a bit of time in school. Um, so whilst I'm not an, ed an educational expert, I've certainly been in schools. Um, to sort of ad address your, your, your question, I think one of the observations that, that we've made and that, that Questacon, with some of its, its new programs, its new facilities, the, particularly the, the, the Technology Learning Centre out at Deakin that many of you may not yet even know about, is kind of under the radar and, and doing some absolutely powerful, powerful things. Um, out there is I, I think these days, um, certainly in communities, cultures, not just the youth, but people, there's, there is certainly, um, I won't say there's a cult of consumption um, out there, but awareness of all of these things, these products which depend on mathematics, everyone is familiar with the products. Some of them may even understand that to some degree that yes, there is maths involved in the back of it. But one of the things when we were doing some of our early investigations about addressing some other areas of skill shortage, um, to help inform the development of some of our programs. Um, we went out and spoke to, to some of the students just to go and see whether or not they saw science and technology in that particular context as vocational. And they, they did. They, they made that very clear. But the vocations which they you know, saw that that leading to were incredibly narrow. Mm -hmm. um, and because they said, well, if I'm not interested in doing sort of a bench coat and cutting, cutting the tails off mice, then why would I go and do the rest of it? Because, you know, why would you do that? And so that was very powerful to us, and we took that, took that on board as far as shaping the, the programs that we did and just how to go and get 
people exposed to the breadth of the applicability of those those subjects. And and picking up a point that that Robin mentioned um, in in her her discussion there, um, it's almost as if we'd conferred beforehand. But unfortunately, nothing was further from the truth. Um, they're just about it's more than just the schools. And I think this is another thing which within um, people with the best of intentions looking to transform the education system, both from inside and outside, coming with great ideas to put yet more burdens on teachers, that there, there is a, a requirement, I believe, that if we're going to actually transform the bulk of that middle, that the school is not enough. And that, that doesn't mean that we don't need to address what happens in the schools, but it's got to go bigger than that. You're in school for a very short period of time in a day. You're in school for a short period of life. Everyone keeps using the terms lifelong learning, but what's actually happening to support the reality of that? And so I think that, that word engagement, which sometimes you might think for Questacon means we're just going to blow stuff up, um, it actually goes, goes beyond that, particularly with the work we're doing now is where we're spending more time focusing on our work with teachers rather than the students to, as I sort of say, move up the food chain uh, to, a, to a more significant point of influence. That we're applying those techniques that we've had for engagement, stimulating curiosity, to actually then go and get that as not the magic source, but an ingredient that we can hopefully share with teachers to go and help, help them deal with both some of their shortages of confidence in, in content areas and to, to get them, I, I'm one of my favorite t-shirts, I just didn't have it clean today um, uh, on that. It's a bit scheduling issue. I need to actually look in the mathematics of, of that. <laughs> Um, apparently you need more than two shirts. I think that's the answer. Um, critical weakness there. Um, with, with that is that one of the t-shirts the has, you know, that's a great question. And particularly in the work that we're doing with primary school teachers uh, that have um, in confidence when they're working with us doing their professional learning because we're not going to, you know, mark them down or sack them or keep them back after school. They, we're a safe space. And they confer onto us going, I don't actually do very much maths at all. I'm not really comfortable with that. And the reality is we talk to them about what they're doing and their work is full of maths. It's for us, we see it's full of maths. For us, we see it's full of science. We see it's full of technology. They're going, no, it's a craft activity. And going, yes, it is a craft activity. But it's that and it's all of the other things if you only knew how to tease it out. And I think that comes to one of those points of getting the teachers from beginning through end really to be comfortable with that. Now, I'm aware of the time, but given that Jeffrey also said that he wanted this to be an interactive session, I'll just take, if I may, sort of three minutes just to go and actually show you and hopefully get your minds to understand kind of the difference that we bring when we tackle these sorts of topics. And I think it, to an extent, it highlights the difference between, if you like, teaching and knowledge and simple skills uh, on that and understanding and that curiosity. And that's one of the things which we spend a lot of our time focusing on, getting that difference emphasised to people. So I'll just take one moment. Okay. So we I will. Have, so I have here a mirror. It's a little flat mirror. I mean, sorry, I would have brought a large one, but there are budget constraints everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> on here. It's a flat mirror. Now, I understand you're all educators, and you are either from science or math, or you do really quick studies anyway. So this is going to be the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection. All right? I'm going to teach you that if you don't know it already. So when light strikes a flat mirror at an angle, it comes off at the same angle. There we go. Naplan 100% <laughs> perfect path on there. So if the beam of light came in at 45 degrees, it would go out at... Oh, you are so good on that. I feel, I feel like an empowered, significantly powerful teacher. That's fantastic. Now, let's just see how we can apply your obviously exquisite 100% understanding of optics and the angle of incidence. So, driving along in a car, as we often do, looking in the rearview mirror, we can see often flashing red lights and the word, you know, Ichlis on there, with police backwards uh, on there. So we're familiar with the fact that looking in the mirror will reverse words left, right. We're all comfortable with that? We understand what's going on there, that's pretty simple. Or is it? Why is it reverse left, right? But why isn't it reverse top, bottom? We don't know. <laughs> Come on, somebody knows the answer to this, sure. <laughs> Mike? Does Mike? Does <laughs> you're, not, you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> and that's my point. And the, the silence that we heard there when we were running our workshops, I love. It often takes five minutes, but during that silence, you can actually start to hear brains working. And then we facilitate it and take it forward. And so
for me, that kind of really crystallises the difference between teaching to a test, the NAPLAN problem, if I could call it that, um, that kind of pressure cooker to teach to, a, teach to a target. Yes, I've got the answer. I could go and put five mirrors and you could go and calculate the angle of reflection on one to the other. On that, that's an extension activity. It really doesn't, it's not an extension of anything. But to ask those deeper questions, and you were talking about deep problems in maths, that meta layer, and you will have terms for what that means in educational approaches, but it's that sort of stuff that we tease out. And that's not hard technically to do. It's not hard for teachers to pick up if they've got the confidence of going, actually, the answer is not the point at the moment. The point is I want you to think about it and come up with a question. Now, you don't have to transform all of education that way, but to have some of that in there, I think, is a power. And it's something which is transportable from classrooms also to parents and the, that influence group around students. Hmm. That's good, Stuart. No, but we're, we're still thinking. You've got to give us the answer to that at some point, don't you? Uh, no, it's not about the answer. <laughs> <laughs> is it, um, my, my impression, Mike, I don't know whether this is true. I'm just to you too, Tom, and, and Robin, I'd like you to chime in here too. But my impression is we've always grizzled in this country about the lack of maths teachers. Uh, my impression is that, you know, from the time that I was at school, but an eon ago, I mean, the maths that I learned was taught by an art teacher who, who really had no expertise whatsoever. Uh, that there was all, there's always been a shortage of maths teachers. I mean, and, and we have this whinge every, every few years about it without seemingly anything happening. Question, is it to do with the shortage of good teachers anyway? And we know that that's a, there's a problem across not just the maths, but everything. Is it, is it that or is it something particularly associated with mathematics? Tom? Um, I, it's a good question because I was reflecting when you said that on... on I was trying to visualise as we do my high school teachers and I got three in my head straight away. One was a PE teacher, one was a chemistry teacher, and one was a mathematics teacher. So, so that's a fair while ago now, too long ago. And, and so there was obviously shortages then. And th that was in the metropolitan area. Mm. So I agree about the grizzling. I think, though, in, in particular for mathematics, um, and it's to Mike's point that, that um, students don't see um, where mathematics can take them um, to some degree, but recently they've started to. And I think the, the STEM disciplines allow the really good mathematicians to see they can become engineers and beyond. Mm. And, and so, as a result, um, lots of capable children are now doing engineering in, in um, increasing numbers. And pleasingly, um, and, and places like Engineers Australia are very good at this, they're really pushing um, girls into engineering. And so, so, so they, they yeah. come, they're, they're advocates, they get into schools, they, they present the sorts of things that you're, you've presented with, uh, uh, you know, they blow something up, you know? And, and straight away, you blow something up in grade nine or grade 10 and you're a good mathematician, you think, I want to be one of those things. And it's, so, so they've got this um, capacity to pitch, to pitch a profile to what they might want to do. And, and so there's only a certain amount of people who want to do mathematics deeply. And, and as Mike suggested, that's, that is declining at the highest levels. And so, in, in a sense, there's so many options now for, for children, you know? I mean... Although, we... uh, yes, but at the same time, uh, if, you look at, if you look at the, the, the status jobs, the prestige jobs, the jobs that seem to be expanding, not contracting, uh, you know, Latin and Greek teaching, I can understand why it's, it may not be attracting that many people, but when the good jobs in merchant banks, in... in, in in, in uh, you know, in derivative trading in, in Silicon Valley are all mathematics-based jobs, and these are the prestige jobs that have status and income. Uh, derivatives traders earn a huge amount. They have to be very good mathematicians in general to be any good. So, so why isn't that market dr drive, in that sense, translating to, uh, to more people wanting to sign up for it? Mark, perhaps to you. Yeah. Well, um, I think other panellists have talked about um, different kinds of or different aspects of engagement. I think Stuart's example uh, demonstrates that you can engage an audience very quickly by giving a relevant example. Mm. And I think Robin's uh, comments uh, about the communities in which she's worked uh, where uh, it's difficult for teachers to make it seem relevant uh, to students unless they have the right kind of cultural perspective. Uh, I think the issue is that a good teacher can make a difference. Uh, I, went, I did a workshop in Western Australia uh, last year with a teacher who'd been teaching in the same primary school for 38 years. And she was self-professed not very strong in mathematics. But she was a wonderful mathematics teacher because uh, she encouraged the right kind of curiosity. 
She had a classroom in which students were uh, expected and certainly allowed to pose questions, even if maybe nobody knew the answer to those questions and the teacher wasn't worried if she didn't know the answer. It was having a kind of uh, attitude in the classroom where your opinion would be valued, uh, where you could have a go, uh, and where you could um, explore problems together. It was, it was just a wonderful experience to work with a teacher with that kind of quality. Essentially, she was also a storyteller. She could just uh, make things come alive with, with her uh, personality. And we need teachers to be storytellers. And to some degree, I think uh, we're you know, a little the victims of the textbook and the curriculum. Uh, I think textbook writers do have a lot to answer for because very often a textbook starts with exercise A, do the left-hand side, do the right-hand side, and then gradually gets more difficult. And then when you get onto exercise G or H, you finally get to the worded problems, right? So the first time we actually meet a context is somewhere quite a long way through the chapter. The chapter is all this dry technical stuff that seems to have no relevance to anything until eventually you get to these worded problems, which may be of varying quality. But of course, the weaker students never get to those problems. So they're kind of double whammy. They, they never see that maths can be used. Some of the other students might naturally understand that it can be used, and they may also get to the worded problems. So we really need to have a more problem-solving orientation right from the beginning when we introduce a topic. The technical skills are something which, as it were, uh, you, you want to learn because you want to solve more problems of the kind. You're drawn in by the question, by the story, by the narrative that sits behind the mathematics. And then you say, oh, Yes, well, if I wanted to solve this kind of problem, I'd have to learn this technical skill. But we seem to often get that back to front. So in a good classroom, the teacher will be able to tell a, a, put a narrative behind the mathematics to bring the students into some kind of engagement and will encourage not only problem solving but problem formulation within that classroom. Mm. Is, who's, yeah, yes. Yeah. I okay. work with schools and around mm -hmm. students making choices about their careers. Um, and they actually choose, like you were saying, the uptake is lower on those advanced subjects or maths in general. Are they choosing those when they're younger? So they choose those in year 10 going into year 11 and 12. Do you think it could help with some education around what careers, as we, we've been mentioning, actually um, involve mathematics and what opportunities at that stage? Because often I speak to students at points later on in like years 11 and 12 and then they haven't realised that that was a part of it or they haven't been doing those subjects and then they see prerequisites and things when they're looking at studying? Who'd like to take this one? Tom? Um, I think you're right. Um, and there's, there's, there's different models with, with education systems over the world that have um, very different structures. And to your point, I think um, it's precisely right that we, at the beginning of grade 10, um, want students to make these decisions and they're locked into those subjects for two years. And, 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 and some of it's sort of um, post-engineered where they're told by career advisors, this is the best way to get a high mark, you know, so do these subjects because these subjects will allow you to get a really high mark. And for other students, they're told straight away, if you do this subject, um, and I've had very personal experience with this with my children, if you do this subject, your mark won't be as high because you're not as good at it as what you think you are, mm. right? Now, um, if you, if you, the science of maximising your ratar. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> but that's now, mathematics too, isn't it? <laughs> now, so, so, and what's what's an alternative to that? Well, a, a classic example, as um, Jeff knows, is Canada, where, for, for, to your point, in grades eleven and twelve, the, the, they the, the students aren't locked in for two years on a pathway, and they actually have to start to choose a year earlier. Which you might think, well, that's crazy, Tom. You're actually making their mind up quicker, but they have to start in year nine and they have a three-year period where they have blocks of subjects. So, mm. so they can, and they start off and they can try base, say a base mathematics course, which is not general in maths. It might be, it's relatively specific maths and they can be really good at that and then they can get an interest out of that, for example. And the same, and the same is the case in English and the same is the case in history, for example, whereas in, in Australia we tend to be very general with our courses and as you've quite rightly pointed out, you're locked in for that period of time and everything's, everything's backdated to how well you're going to go to get that ATAR. Mm. And, that, and that's, that could well be um, a limitation. Can we return to a point that was raised early on and that was uh, the issue of, of girls' engagement with mathematics? I, mean, I think was Michael made the comment that, that at the very highest levels we're seeing fewer students attempt difficult courses and difficult streams of mathematics, girls in particular. Robin, is, is, is that something that you've come across? I mean, is that one an issue that you see as an issue, a problem? Or, and if so, why? And answer all of that in, uh, in one minute. 
Okay. Did you ask me that? Ask yeah. me that because I'm the woman. No, on the and I knew you would say that too. <laughs> <laughs> One of the areas I don't. This look is at a gender-free discussion. <laughs> is I don't look at gender. So yeah. I, have, oh. I haven't. I haven't studied gender, so I'm not the right person to answer that question. Mike, do you have a view about that? As to you, you made the comment initially. I, I do have uh, views about the importance of encouraging um, girls to get involved in, in mathematics because, in my experience, uh, they're just as capable, but they don't necessarily uh, see the pathways as obviously. Uh, uh, an example would be in informatics or algorithmics, algorithmic thinking, where uh, computers are seen as boys' toys and uh, girls, uh, therefore, don't have that same kind of natural attraction to computers, and yet uh, we regularly find that girls will do really well on the kind of um, algorithmic questions which suggest that they would have potential to be programmers. And often you've got a st you, you can talk with a student that's uh, done really well on one of these competitions and say, well, you know, you, you should learn to program because you'd be very good at it. And they, it hasn't necessarily occurred to them uh, that there would be a, a connection. Uh, and we've tried uh, in, in our high-level training schools to get uh, more girls involved, uh, and we're gradually making some progress in, in that regard, but it, it is a struggle to overcome sort of a, a kind of um, in, inertia or, or, or reluctance on the part of girls to see themselves uh, in that light. Hmm. Um, so it, it is an issue. Are there maths teachers here in the, in the group tonight? Um, Anybody want to have a go at this is in their own experience in relation to engaging girls in maths education? Here in the ACT, it's not as much of a problem as it is Australia-wide, which is, relates to the ACT's yeah. population, educational ability overall. Yeah. No, I've taught girls, well, 15 years I've been teaching. Um, particularly year eight girls, I find there's a huge drop-off in their interest in mathematics in grade eight. Uh, they're just... Well, what, why, is that, why is that? Do you think? I mean, do they articulate it's that? Not, it's not cool. It's not cool. You, yeah. it, it, they, they're interested. They, they're starting to get interested in makeup and other things, and you, you try to sort of interest them in varying stories about mathematics, but it's it's just not cool for girls to do maths. Generally speaking, um, I must admit that our school, where I'm at, some of the better girls I've taught have kept going, which is really great. But you see other girls that are just a bit, not quite as good as them, but they just drop right off. And no matter all the encouragement under the sun, you, you find it really difficult mm. to engage them. They, there's an attitude, uh, you're talking about the society outside school, you know, mum and dad don't do maths, my mum doesn't do maths, why should I do maths? But you're, you know, you're quite talented, you've got skills. No, but I don't want to do it, it's not, you know, so they, mm. you know, they mm. just switch off. Is that the experience that others have had teaching in the classroom, that, that, uh, that, that girls tend to drop out at a faster rate? Yes, Robin. Mm. I think it's too simple just to say girls. Um, I think you've got to look at the intersection of girls and, say, social class, uh, girls and their ethnic background. Um, we know that middle-class girls and middle-class boys are more likely to engage in mathematics at similar rates um, and succeed as, as equally as well. Working class girls are less likely than working class boys to engage in mathematics. Conversely, Aboriginal girls are more likely to engage in mathematics than Aboriginal boys. So I think it's sometimes a little bit too simple when we just say hmm. um, the gender... Can you tease some of that out for us? What, what, why is that? Why, why is there a cultural freight associated with being good at mathematics the, 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 the more privileged you might be in the community? Um, I haven't got any data that I could say this is why, why it actually happens. I think it's just the backgrounds of the kids, um, the parental expectations. Um, probably, I'm a working class girl. Um, I was going to be the only girl in year 12 to do maths and science. I dropped out of it because why would I be the only girl to hang out with all the boys in year 12? Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm interested in. Pardon? Yeah, <laughs> could have been. I might have married somebody differently. Um, <laughs> um, but I think I think there are a whole lot of a lot of factors that go mm. in with that. Um, I think if you start to look at the ethnic backgrounds of um, the, the students as well, some cultures might have different roles for their daughters as opposed to their sons, um, and that actually feeds through. So the parents and the and the the communities that the kids come from actually shape how they see themselves, um, how they see themselves in relation sure. to particular areas. So, 
I'm wondering whether that, tr that is a, a, a statement that's true in a sense of, of education in general, or is it particularly associated with mathematics? Um, it's probably true of education generally, but I think the biggest impact we see is in mathematics because mathematics is probably the most empowering and disempowering of all of our curriculum areas. It's, it's um, one of the areas, if you ask any kid, if you're smart, how do you know if a kid's smart? It's because they can do mathematics. Mm. Um, and they can also, the converse is also true. So the impact's most profound in mathematics. It doesn't matter if you're a girl and you can't do phys ed um, or sport. That's not quite, it doesn't have the so, same social stigma or status that goes with that. But uh, with mathematics, it does. That's an interesting point. I mean, you, uh, this, we have this sort of disjunct in a way, don't we, that in the community that, that uh, I mean, the point you, you make, Robin, I think is entirely true that the mark of a smart person is the person who's good at mathematics. And yet we strangely, according to Mike and, and, and uh, Tom, we're not, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not valuing it as such. Stuart, I mean, you, you, you're, uh, you're out there engaging with people. I mean, two things. That, you know, a girl's education and that latter comment. If it's seen as a badge of smartness, why isn't it more valued? Uh, yeah, again, all the, all the nice, easy, easy questions. Um, the, I, I think one of the points I would pick up there, though, is comes back to that more than just the school point of view, and that's one of the things which I'm sure is a very strong feedback on performance of students in school because as I said earlier the number of hours that you spend in school uh, is relatively short compared to the number of hours where you've got opportunities to learn and follow, follow your curiosity if you're curious about makeup you'll spend two hours four hours um, I don't have any of my family that are that, that way inclined so I can actually get into the bathroom so um, but I'm sure in other families when those curiosities are there if you're curious about mathematics curious about geometry curious about art those sorts of things you take up lots of hours and that's one of the things which leads to excellence it's that question of 10,000 hours um, and if you like sport you'll put in 10,000 hours if you like those mm. things you'll put in 10,000 hours if you're struggling with your homework and you go home and the first thing you get typically from your your mother who's a principal caregiver and homework recipient um, on on that is you know I, I was terrible at maths at school as well what hope is there for, for that child to, to, really, to really bloom? And that's, that's one of the things which overseas, some of the other uh, programs which are recognising that, sort of the homework clubs, the, the mentoring uh, opportunities that, that expand the, the ability for students to go, no, actually, I am interested or I do need to get this done, um, actually work, work well. And one of the other things which we haven't done, and I'm here trying to talk myself into um, carving the day into even smaller hours and thinking about how we might do that, We've done some very successful science for mums programs. Mm -hmm. Again, looking at this, one of the things we do when we're looking at our program design is what, what's, the, what's the target? It's the student. We want them to learn. What's the problem? What's the group that can influence that? So we can work with the students, but who's the group that influences it? So in that particular one, we picked one of those groups, which was mothers, and said, well, we'll work with them so that they can foster that, going, I don't know, but let's try. And if they were doing that for, for mathematics, maths for mums might very well be another way of recruiting more hours, more support, more encouragement to, to actually then sort of foster that, that middle group. It's an interesting point, isn't it? We in the community probably generally think that uh, although mathematics expertise is a badge of smartness, it's okay not to be good at it. Um, it's not okay in the community not to be good at reading and writing. So you, you would never, I think, get a parent saying, well, don't worry, I couldn't read when I was at school either, and I certainly can't write very well. Uh, it's not okay to do those things culturally, whereas it is okay to be no good at maths. Mike, you wanted to chime in here. Yeah, I'd just like to pick up on Stuart's comment about curiosity and relate that to why uh, girls might drop out of maths in year eight. Or, in fact, a lot of students uh, disengage with mathematics around year and seven and eight. And I'm, I'm going to use the, the A word, if that's okay. Um, algebra. Um, it, it, if you think about the way that often we introduce algebra in high school, we ask students to collect like terms. Uh, the A's have got to go with the A's, and the B's have got to go with the B's. And the A-B's, however, don't go with either the A's or the B's. They go with other A-B's, and if you get any A-squares, they go with the A-squares. We do all of this stuff. There is absolutely no obvious reason why we're doing it. It's very hard for the students to have the sort of um, postponement of gratification that eventually this is all going to go somewhere which is actually useful. So we've got to think about ways of teaching important concepts like algebraic concepts, which is more empowering. Because algebra is the most totally empowering element in mathematics. And it can be taught right from the beginning in a way in which students can see what it can do uh, 
in, in, in very simple terms. Well, uh, give us an example, Mark. Uh, what I'm uh, saying is that... I mean, you're here to, you're here to, do, well, to do this. I mean, tell, I mean, tell me why it's going to be useful. Uh, again, uh, uh, algebra is, is essentially a, a narrative. It, it's a story about what's happening to numbers. So if I tell you that you, you get this number, and if you double it and you add three, you get a certain number out, if I say you get seven out, you can tell me what the original number was, and so can 10-year-old students. So they can actually do algebra, but we teach it in a way that is totally separate from that story and just say you've got to learn these rules. And that means that we're, we're disempowering them because they cannot see the relevance of, uh, of the subject. So not uh, unless they have a really strong sense of, well, eventually this is going to take me somewhere, they're going to disengage. Can I just sure, make yes. just, just one point, sort of backing that up? Some of some of our other speakers here today have sort of used sort of you know, problem solving, what the practical applications are, and, and those those sorts of topics, where we spend more of our time not tackling maths directly in our work, but we do some with maths. But we, we tackle other topics. You might call them you might call them engineering. We might call them tinkering or hacking or making or doing stuff with your hands to go and engage your brain. We've been doing that for a while. We've always felt that it worked quite well. When we decided to take these things um, a bit more seriously, with a bit more rigor on that, we started to do what every good researcher does, which is called confirmation bias. So you start looking through the literature to find those things which support what your, your view is, um, that doing things the way we're doing was the right way of doing it. Long story short is we found quite a lot of research coming out of European universities looking at the, the pedagogy of how best to teach engineering because that was kind of what we were interested in. And surprise, surprise, it was flipped exactly the way we've been talking here as one of the ways which might be applied to mathematics. Engineering has drifted into more and more focus on here, here's the maths, study the maths, do the calculus, do these sorts of things, and then eventually we'll put you out in front of a, a, mega, a mega structure and hope that it doesn't fall on someone. And they, they realize that these people can't solve problems, they can barely shot, tie their shoelaces, uh, but if you give them the right problem formulated the right way, they will calculate the right number. And that's what we've been training through engineering. The, the, the Nordic countries were looking at this and they've dis discovered and adopted and done the studies that show it needs to be flipped the other way around. Get them started, get them in, get them to fail, get them to struggle, and at that point you're going, look, you're having, a, you're having trouble here. Do you know why you're having trouble? You don't understand this bit of the mathematics, this bit of the system. Let's look at that now in the context of the problem and now they see the utility of it, they see the applicability of it, and they'll go, next time I bump into a problem like that, I've got an understanding of the framework of the relationships that run underneath it. And it's not an anti-academic, an anti-elite process at all, although it kind of, to some extent, it might look a bit more, you know, uh, practical rather than uh, applied and rigorous. Mm. Okay. This has been really fascinating. Uh, I've been involved with sport almost all my life, and it wasn't until I started coaching that I started realizing how amazing mathematics is. So given our um, general uh, fascination with sport in Australia and gambling, is, it, is there a way of getting to mass, making mass more accessible via sport? Well, I mean, that, that is exactly, I mean, mathematics is, it's, 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 it's important in every sphere of human activity. Tom, you Don't start me. <laughs> Let's get together. I mean, the, what, what's, what's interesting though um, is that if, if you try and take sport analogies into mathematics and, and, and mathematics analogies into sport, you, you, ha you actually have to know what you're doing in both areas to get it right. And what, what, uh, uh, otherwise, what happens is what I call theme-based learning, where, um, and, and the classic example in um, primary schools all over the world is when the Olympics are on. So, so um, in an Olympic year, there'll be a unit of mathematics work based on the Olympics. And, and all the children will go out and they'll do a long jump and they'll do some high jump and, and they might run um, 10 metres and then, and then they have to predict where the, the fastest person in the world will go and, all, and, and so on. Now, it's well-meaning it's well meaning and, and um, it gets the children enthused for a while, but unfortunately, if, if, if the sport component's not right, so in other words, if the, if the sport expert isn't helping... And, and, and if mathematically you simply go back to basically just doing word problems like what is the difference between, um, uh, the, you know, Carl Lewis high jump and, and your high jump and basically all you're doing is doing 2.64 metres take away 0.96 of a metre, you know, the children start to see through it very quickly. And, and, and as a result, they, 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 they see it as uh, um, something that um, is unconvincing to them. And it's almost like... 
um, there's this push to draw to draw out of it things that um, are not really there, right? But I know what you're talking about, and and that would be things like um, um, people people who are very capable of the sport typically have very high spatial reasoning ability. For example, now if you've got high spatial reasoning ability, it sets you up really well for mathematics. Okay, and so then if if we look differently at it and, and think about what elements of, of perception and, and prediction in sport and, and the way in which timing happens and the way in which movement happens and, and, how, and how that can relate to mathematical ideas, it, it turns it on its head. And if you make the things open-ended and investigative in nature, to, to Stuart's point, then you've really got it, you know? And, and, that, can, and that, can help, that can help allow um, um, students to buy into, into, into it more often. And, and, and that's true with sport, but it could also be equally true with a whole range of other other um, related disciplines. But if you go the wrong way um, from experience, it's a disaster because it just breaks everything down to very mundane things. And what ends up happening is it, it fuzzies out any opportunity of mathematical depth and indeed any opportunity of sport depth. <laughs> so it's that, I mean, you can tell I, I totally agree with what you're saying and, and, and um, I think it's critical, but you have to be careful too. Just, just grab the mic, uh, Stuart. Too many years of not needing a microphone. Um, there's a very good program that's been running in the UK for um, that has combined um, sports and mathematics. Uh, I'm struggling to remember the name of it at, at the moment, but effectively it was an after-school, not quite a maths club, but an after-school program, not only for students that were uh, struggling with mathematics, so it wasn't a remedial process, it was primarily just picking up kids at risk. So it was high performers at risk of not achieving, you know, lower performers at risk of just not, not getting there. Uh, and they combined maths and sport as a, as a way of you know, at least uniting them. But the kinds of mathematics which they were doing were taking them to sporting grounds, actually looking at trying to estimate, doing things like estimation uh, of that. Is, you know, here's that, how many seats are there? You're going to try counting them. Well, okay, well, you give up fairly soon. Let's move to estimation. All right, now, let's, let's stand out here and start monitoring crowds coming in on the weekend and, okay, how are you going to estimate the number of crowds? What have you noticed on that? What would you do now to think about how you could maximise the time or minimise the time in which it takes the crowd to get in, try to get out, and do some of these modelling things in the context of that? Now, that's, that's real-world problems. You solve those problems, you earn a lot of money designing stadiums um, just in that alone. But, again, it's, it becomes something which can, can be light or deep, depending on how far you want to go with those. So there, there is something available in that space, but, again, it requires teachers comfortable and support in a school environment. We haven't spoken much about support in a school environmental context to, to allow any of these perhaps more innovative or disruptive activities to actually um, mm. kick off. And that's, a, that's another challenge. It's a, almost a chicken and egg argument, though, to some degree, isn't it? Because, uh, in essence, to pick up you know, Mark's point, uh, these real-world problems are interesting, but you need some, uh, some old-world um, technical uh, skills to actually attack them. In other words, you need some trigonometry or some, some algebra to actually, having identified the problem, what are the tools we bring to bear to solve it? Yeah. The Nordic countries came up uh, a little while ago um, and uh, somehow we're told that Finland has got it right or France or something like that. And I'm just wondering if you'd like to comment on, on whether, whether they are and what are they doing right if they are and, uh, and so on. Hmm. Tom? Uh, Finland was doing it right until ab about 12 months ago. And they were doing it right because they were monocultural. And so as a result, test scores, um, there was, to Robin's point, almost no tail because culturally um, um, most people spoke um, one language as their first language. So that really helps when, you, when, when you're having tests. The other thing they were doing really right is they had um, high um, socio advantage which any, any place can do well um, if you've got high... Well, most places can do well with high um, socio advantage. And the other thing that they were um, doing really well is very similar to some of these high-performing um, Asian countries, they're very traditional in, their, in, 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 in their, their approaches. So if you take, you know, culturally, um, uh, that country, say, compared to, to, to the Swedes, they're very, they're very different in, in the way in which they try and structure even, well, anything. You know, and and I'm not suggesting one's better than the other, but but there's a, there's, there's common links and common threads between these high-performing countries and not. I've got um, 
colleagues who, who have made a lot of money out of, out of Finland being so highly ranked in Tim's and Pisa. They go all over the world and they present um, and they get paid a fortune to go and talk to other countries um, about how well they're doing it and, and it's just dried up. They, 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 they have to go back and get a real job now because they, 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 <laughs> the storyline stops. So it's really interesting how, um, you know, um, s- some of these... I mean, the reason it was flagged, it's a really important question, the reason why was it flagged because it was non-Asian. So everyone said, well, they're our answer. We can't replicate what's happening in some of these Asian countries like um, uh, Taiwan or Singapore. Um, um, but we could maybe do what the Finns are doing. Let's get onto that, you know? And, and so it, it, part of this has become this incredible um, uh, embodiment around that. Mm. Having said that, the Finns do some really good things. We, and we think that might work. Like, they hardly ever test children, right? So, so that's one thing we should all... T- they hardly ever test children. So that so it's it's interesting that that was one of the um, the things that the um, that the Americans couldn't handle when they went over to research it because the Americans were testing you know most frequently, and the, and so there's, there's this view that the more you test, the worse you get you know and so it freed up it freed them up and it freed them up flexibly. But the but the country that was doing best right at the beginning was was Sweden, hmm. and and what happened was they opened their borders. Um, and they got um, many refugees in, and they had that, that their policies changed and become very flexible. And all of a sudden, they weren't doing as well anymore. And people started to think, "Oh, their education system's falling apart." How strange to think that the education system doesn't fall apart at all. They're still doing brilliantly. Their marks aren't any good anymore compared to what they were because they've got different challenges in their society. And and, and as mm. to Robin's point, they're supporting a whole lot of different cultures and contexts. I'm keen to pick up that point, Robin. How, how do you attack that then? I mean, you've, you've made the point that there are cultural issues going on here. How, how do you attack it? How do you, how do you start doing... How do we start improving it? Um, I think, first of all, there's not one single approach that's going to work. Um, it's almost like we can have a pedagogy for our mainstream students, and then we've got to start thinking about what pedagogy would look like for our our disadvantaged students, our culturally diverse students, our linguistically diverse students, our socially diverse students, because they all come with different backgrounds, uh, with different needs, uh, with different home lives, um, and we've got to tackle it from that perspective. A lot of it about is about teachers understanding the students, where they're coming from, What's their language background? How do they make sense of the mathematics? How do they make sense of how do I even talk to a student? Um, We know, for example, when we say to um, working class parents are more likely to give their students a directive, go and do the dishes. Middle class parents are more likely to say, would you like to go and do the dishes? Um, You say to a working class kid, would you like to go and do mathematics? You know what they're going to say. So a lot of it is about trying to understand where the children are coming from. And we can do that in a lot of ways, in terms of initial teacher education, professional development, the schools I'm working in, there is a lot of professional development in those schools on how to work with Indigenous students, understanding the backgrounds. And one Indigenous student or one group of students or one community is very different from the community 50 50, um, kilometres down the road. So we do have to understand our students and where they're coming from. We have to understand how our pedagogies that we use actually either include or exclude students. Um, In mathematics, for example, we use the terms more and less. Um, Which number is too more? Which number is too less? Surprise, surprise, working class students don't usually use the term less in their home vocabulary. So in the early years of schooling, those kids are missing out on 50% of our comparative language that we're using. How many teachers know that? Probably not as many as should. So it's actually trying to understand where those kids are coming from, what what um, knowledge they're bringing into the school, what knowledge we have as teachers that are actually either including or excluding those students. So we need to do a lot more research to find out what are those um, issues, particularly as we're becoming more racially and culturally diverse in this country, um, finding out where the students are coming from and how our pedagogy and how our mathematics has to change that as well. The Islamic um, system, for example, for banking is very different from our capitalist economy. So ha- what does it mean when we're sort of talking about banking and making money and making percentages and making or kind of ripping people off? The Islamic banking system doesn't do that. So what does that mean for those kids when we're talking about profits and losses? It's probably not the same as we take for granted in mathematics. So there's a lot of things that we need to do. Mm. Um, And a lot of it is understanding who we've got in our classroom. Mm, Okay. Yeah, questions, yes. One of my colleagues recently told me that uh, in Korea, 
teachers are extremely highly valued. The secondary school teachers are extremely highly valued. Um, and this has, according to him, creates a, its own set of problems. Um, I wonder whether or not the way teachers are perceived in our country um, could be improved. And um, what role should government play uh, in this? All right, Christopher Pine, after a difficult week in Parliament, has been uh, has vacated his post and uh, he's offered it to anybody on the panel. Uh, what are we going to do about that particular problem, Mike? I'm, I'm happy to start off. I'm sure everybody's got something to say on this. Um, uh, my life has been in teaching and uh, I wanted to teach. I'm sure there were lots of other things I could have done that would have earned me more money, but I happened to want to teach. Unfortunately, uh, if you're strong in maths and science, there are many temptations which will uh, seem quite attractive in comparison with what teaching uh, has to offer. And I think it's a significant problem uh, in terms of uh, how our society values teachers. And I even hear teachers say, and this always depresses me quite a lot, um, oh no, you're, you're really good, you're too good to be a teacher. And th this is profoundly depressing. Uh, we, we have a culture in which um, law and medicine are at the pinnacle of, of uh, societal expectation of what constitutes. You know, if you really want to prove that you're clever, uh, once you've got the ATAR score, you then have to either do law or medicine because then people mm. will know you've got a badge that says you did law or medicine. Must if you become a teacher, ATAR. there will be an assumption made that you're really not that clever. Uh, and it's very hard to do anything about that. So uh, I, I think you raise a very, very significant problem. We, we do not value teachers. We do not uh, think of uh, a, a teacher as being a really capable person that uh, has a great deal to offer. And therefore, it's not a choice which uh, a lot of people are going to make uh, given, given many attractive alternatives. Um, in, in many ways, uh, uh, and in, in some of the Asian countries, uh, it's, it's much more highly valued. I mean, Korea, you mentioned, but uh, I was talking to uh, somebody in Singapore recently uh, who was um, an international maths Olympiad medalist uh, teaching in a high school, and he didn't think there was anything particularly unusual about that. It was what he wanted to do, and he was able to pursue his passion because it was where he could, knew he could make the most difference. That would be much less likely uh, in, in Australia. Mm. Anybody else on the panel? I mean, one of the problems, of course, the teachers face is, like everybody else who's essentially on the public payroll, and given the Western world's fascination with trying to reduce the size of government and the size of government spending on everything, uh, unfortunately, wages for public sector employees are going to, always going to be in that mix, and therefore it's going to be difficult. So if a measure of status is going to be high incomes, that's, that's a problem. Is there, a, is there another way forward to improve the status of teachers? Anybody? Yes, Robin. Actually, I don't think pay comes into it at all. Um, and there's been a lot of research that says people don't do jobs for the money. They do it for an intrinsic motivation. Um, I think one of the biggest things that we can do to improve the status of our teachers is look at the media that, and how it portrays. Um, I'm doing a big study at the moment and it's about great teachers, what, teach, what schools are working in remote communities. Um, and it doesn't get media. But if we wanted to say that this school down the road was doing a really lousy job and the teachers are really bad and the kids are really bad, that's going to get into the press. So what we have to do is change public perception um, about the great jobs that teachers are doing. And when we do that, that's when teacher go, teachers are going to feel rewarded for the work that they do. The media, sorry, the media has got a lot to answer for in terms of how they're presenting um, the work of teachers and the work of schools. And if we can change that, then teachers will feel valued because I think a lot of teachers just don't feel valued mm. for the work that they're doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess my question jumps straight on from what Robin was, was just saying then. Um, I guess one of the things, and, and Phil, you'd probably be aware of this over the past few weeks, people have been talking about uh, literacy among teachers and, and talking about whether or not teachers should be passing exams on their way out just to, to establish their level of literacy. We didn't hear as much in that debate about numeracy. Is that because the Australian public, the media, kind of look at maths and go, well, maths is hard. We give teachers a bit of a pass that they might not have to do maths. And is that doing the general school of teachers a bit of a disservice that that maths is something that 
they should be recognised as as whether they're doing a good job rather than than the media kind of saying, it's a bit hard, we don't have to hold you up to a standard. There are, the teachers are going to have to do, as far as, far as I've heard, and unless it's changed in the last couple of days, teachers will have to do a literacy and numeracy test. So I think what's being, and I haven't heard what's been portrayed, um, I've been out bush for a while, um, is that um, teachers will have to do that test. And I was talking to a group of people who were sitting and designing those tests, the numeracy tests for teachers. So it is literacy and numeracy. And again, um, what you've heard is probably part of the story rather than the whole story. So we are, we are worried, concerned, um, maybe fairly or unfairly, about the literacy and numeracy levels of teachers. So numeracy is in there as well. Mm. Tom? And, and just, I mean, I think we've, uh, and we've, we've tried to do this a little bit, and, and you have too, to sort of steer away from teachers a little bit. Like, as I get slower and, and fatter and more unhealthy, no one blames my doctor, you know, and, and, and I don't know why, I don't know why we, and, and the point's been made that, that everything's about mathematics has to be about the teachers, and, and, and we've all tried to make that point, as, as you have too, and it, it's, it's, it's fascinating that we're um, having to test our teachers, to your point, but we don't test our doctors, and so, or our lawyers, um, and, or, um, and so it's, interest, it's an interesting thing where we actually feel that this is so important, to your po point, Phil, um, it's, it's so important, um, education, and teachers are so important, and yet we don't think they're any good. And, and we must think they're good. If you, to, 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 where's your little mirror now? We must think that we must think they're very good because we want to test them and prove that they're good, or we have to make sure they're good. Otherwise, because otherwise we can't um, risk them without in the hands of our children and grandchildren, right? And yet we don't. With other with other professions, once you get through and you've got your ticket, um, typically um, we assume you're okay. And so it's it's. And, and it's, it's this point about if we're the, the politicians and, and the media and, 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 and the community, we have to give teachers a break, you know? That, that's the only... The perception can only change that way. And, and, and the very good example of um, South Korea um, and, and the equally good example about Singapore is that the teachers are looked upon to be incredibly um, um, important components of the, of the community and highly valued. And they don't, to Robin's point, they don't get paid any more than our teachers do, right? So it's not like Singaporean teachers get a lot more money relatively than Australian teachers. They don't, mm -hmm. n nor do Korean teachers. Is that true? That's true, is it? The, the they don't. Okay. They don't. Mm. I mean, in, in some of the um, uh, Scandinavian countries, they do. Mm. And in Canada, they do. But, but in, in, with the Canadian system, um, th their uh, mean average is... Um, annual wage is much higher than that of Australia, but there's, there's a whole lot of other things they have to do for it, like they get paid to do sport and all those sorts of things. So they actually get plus-plus okay. um, engagement. So it's not about money. Stuart? I just, uh, just to sort of flesh some, some of that out and pick up some of the points on the, on the way through, we're talking about what other ways are there to go and improve the um, society's attitude for, for, for teachers. And certainly there are those countries that, that uh, value teachers because they clearly see, particularly the developing Southeast Asian countries, they see that the route to development uh, requires high education, and therefore supporting teachers in the education system is the route to development. There, there, there's not a question. That's not a question. That's the way forward. And, and these places will go without sewerage and invest in schools. You may question the quality of the education system that they then run, but they're all behind education uh, to, to go and get there. So they're, they're very motivated as a society. And we see that from our work. These are the ones which want to invest in science centres and education and everything which helps in that space. Coming, coming back to that, that the potential of what other things have been tried, both to support the quality of uh, people going into teaching. Um, US, there's a number of systems there which are bringing in um, people trained professionally with uh, qualifications, if you like, sort of late entry. So they may have been doing engineering for two or three years with a, a rapid transit pass through from being an engineer into a science teacher, and they're, they're diversifying the number of pathways for those people to enter. Uh, the thing which often happens is they do enter, they discover that it's great, some of them stay, some of them leave, uh, but when they leave, they know just how hard teaching really is, uh, and they then become an advocate for just, you know, look up to teachers, because that's a hard job. That goes back out into the community. And one of the things, certainly, that Questacon looks after, we administer 
are the Prime Minister's prizes for, for, for science. There are also two prizes in amongst that which are for teaching, both primary and secondary, which are some very significant recognitions and awards for that. But coming back to that sport and maths competition uh, earlier, if you know a, uh, a rugby player pulls a hamstring that night, um, there won't be much about any of the Prime Minister's prizes on the media. <laughs> It'll all yeah. be about someone's <laughs> groin. I could, talk, I could talk endlessly about, the, about what the media does and reflect our own cultural attitudes, but maybe that's not the right point to say. Yes. Yeah, can I just... Um, two, two small points uh, uh, just uh, to reflect on my own experience. So uh, at, at school I had good results. I, was, uh, I had the option of any course I chose to, so medicine, law, anything I wanted, but I wanted science, which I worked in for 15 years and enjoyed it. Uh, I worked in government science for about that length of time and then I decided to go into teaching, which I've done for 10 years now. And I'll tell you what, for about the same, the pay's not the big deal, uh, but it is an incredible workload in teaching and I think people often don't understand that. So. And I think the, the second unrelated point was uh, about student motivation in, in their studies. When I was going through school, it was mostly recession times, high unemployment, and it wasn't easy to get part-time jobs. A lot of our students now have part-time jobs and they're doing quite a number of hours doing that. And mm. I think it's just easy to get the money now. They can't see the, uh, the purpose for doing all this extra hard work and after-hours work. Mm. Yeah, any other... Any other yes, yes? I wanted to ask the panel's view on what impact assessment has on how mathematics is taught in schools. And I don't just mean NAPLAN, I mean our requirement for assessment right through to the top end. Well, this, the assessment hasn't, uh, hasn't had much of a rap on the panel so far, but <laughs> Mike. <laughs> well, I, I might start with... Um, I, can I just make a quick comment about the previous uh, comment mm -hmm. and, and the discussion about teachers? And I, I don't want it to remain on teachers, and, and then I'll come to the point on assessment. Uh, we've discussed... Uh, uh, bringing a few things together, we've discussed the fact that there are declining numbers doing STEM subjects. There was a, dis a debate as to whether... Uh, the, sh the shortage of math teachers is any worse now than it was in tw 20 or 30 years ago. Yep. Ma maybe it, it, it was, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But if there are an increasing number of jobs available for people who have mathematical capacity, and if there are a decreasing number of students uh, going into those pathways, then if teaching is not a desirable outcome, the problem is only going to get worse. So I just want to make that observation. Right. So even if it's not worse than it was 30 years ago, it's going to get worse unless we do something to reverse uh, that cycle. But with regard to assessment, um, uh, yeah, we, we could very easily get into NAPLAN. And I, I'm actually, I mean, I, I could say some very positive things about NAPLAN, but there's, there are also many difficulties with it. Um, but in general, um, assessment is a good thing if it's used constructively. In other words, if assessment is a genuine part of the learning process and not simply a moment to stop learning and just uh, check up on how you're going, because if you keep doing that, you are taking away time from learning. So good assessment is an integral part of the learning process and, and then it can be uh, students, that the, the motivation and even the competitive element that can come from engaging in that assessment can be uh, something that will lift students. So it, it, it's just a matter of integrating it. Well, it's not just, it's not an easy thing to do necessarily, but it is a matter of, of seeing it as a part of the learning process rather than, than separate and, and only an endpoint. I'm sure others have more research findings to bring to this. Yeah. Tom. I mean, I think most teachers would agree with that, and I think most teachers do that. And, and fr fr from what I've seen in, in almost you know, every country I've been to, um, teachers start with assessment, not finish with assessment, but the publicity is the finished product. And, that, and that's, and so, so and, and in the end, the students remember the finished product. And, and you know, I've, I've got, and as Robin has too, we've got horror stories of children who remember when they become bad at maths, and it was in grade four or grade eight, and it was either algebra or fractions. And, and previously, before it got thrown out of the curriculum, it was long division, right? So it's either fractions, long division, or algebra. And that's when, if you... If, and, and so they remember the, the end assessment. But the teachers are assessing, hopefully, the whole way through, and particularly starting with assessment. Because to Robin's point, you have to start with assessment to know where the children are at. And then, th then it flows on. But the media, to your point, the media and the hype is all about the end product. It's, it's, it's the end point of assessment. And... Um, it doesn't happen in Australia yet, um, but, you know, I mean, in Singapore, 
um, there's a particular time of the year, about about two weeks before the PSLE scores come out, which is the, the leaving certificate for grade six children. And to your point, you think it's bad here where in year 10 you have to decide your life. Well, in Singapore, um, the test in year six decides your life, right? And for about two and a half weeks, all of the schools have these signs up get, getting ready to display the children who performed really highly for their school because what they want, this is in, in the grade six, what they want is, is, is the top children going to their school, right? And so, so for about two and a half weeks, when you're driving through near these schools, the signs are up ready and then as, as the results come out, these children's named, names are named okay, <laughs> on this board. And that's, that is the ultimate end product. And these children are 11 and 12 years old because if they do really, really well, they get to go to the elite high schools. And in those elite high schools, um, the best of the best get targeted into industry for three to four years and then get targeted into government. So that's the other ironic thing. In, in Singapore, the two most highly sought-after professions, if you like, are teaching and politicians. Right? So, so completely different than here. Yeah, all right. Look, we'd better wrap it up. Uh, we said we'd finish at six, and uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm, as a runner of a radio program, I always like to finish on time because the news is always coming. Uh, there's been some pretty good news out of this tonight too. Uh, thank you for coming, and in particular thanks to our panel too, Mike, Tom, Robin and Stuart. Uh, appreciate your time this, this evening and your expertise. And I hope we've given you some food for thought. Thanks very much, everyone.